Let's get started. Um, thanks for coming to this talk, which is uh, a Python script to replace a DOS batch file. So if you are born after 1990, you probably don't know what a DOS batch file is. <laughs> it's okay, you can still listen to the talk. <laughs> and please welcome our speaker, Greg. Hi everyone, welcome to uh, Pi Ohio, and I hope the first session was good, and I hope I can you know, keep the momentum going here for you all. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is introduce myself. My name is Craig Lang, I'm a software developer in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I started out hardware engineering, de developing television transmitters for 10 years, then jumped into the software business. I've been working the past 12 years programming an application with C++ and JavaScript. Okay, so that gives you an idea of where I might be track-wise. Um, so you can kind of see that something like Python might be outside of a comfort zone of somebody like me. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about today, is being outside of comfort zone zone and turning a DOS batch script into a Python script. So let's get started. First thing I wanted to do was to tell you a little bit about my development day. Uh, first thing I do when I come in in the morning is take a look at the daily build. I look at the status page on the website to see if it built properly. Next thing I do is I ask some coworkers, hey, did the build, was the build good today? Did you try it out? Did it seem to work? After that, the next thing I do is I look at regression tests to see if regression tests had passed. Once everything looks good and I say, okay, yes, I can install the daily build, the next set of steps is to uninstall the build I currently have, download the new build, and then install that new build. Then after that, I go about my day writing, writing code, putting features into the product, testing those features, running regressions, deciding if it's good to commit, seeing if it meets the customer's expectations, and then check it in. So this happens on a typical daily basis. Sometimes I might skip a couple days of downloading the build, but you can kind of see here that there's parts of this process that are not necessary for me to pay a whole lot of attention to. And so those three parts of the process I've highlighted in green up here. And the first one is to in uninstall the build, which is basically running a command line program that uninstalls, downloading the new build. I use a wget program to download from a local server, internal server. And then to install the new build, I just run setup.exe and it installs the build. I pass it a couple of arguments depending upon what I'm working on. So you can kind of get an idea that these three things, they're command line based. So if they're command line based, maybe there's some way I can automate that. My company really isn't paying me to be there to uninstall and reinstall. They're paying me to write features. So I thought, okay, very early on in my career as a uh, software developer, I encountered a coworker, a uh, pretty colorful person by the way, who always had a way of saying things and very, very terse, very forcefully he'd come out and kind of said, you know, if you can type it at a command line, why not script it? So I decided to start doing that. But at that time, being a hardware engineer, I wasn't very familiar with programming. I was very, I was much comfortable with the command line, so I started writing my scripts with MS-DOS. How many people in here have written batch scripts with MS-DOS. Okay, great. <laughs> How many people in here would like to use P Python instead? Okay. <laughs> so let's see. So we'll talk a little bit about the script that I had written. And basically this script does those three things in, in process there. So of course I initialize my variables and then you'll see that somewhere down along the, the way in my script, I have this blown up a little bit since you may not be able to see it, is I echo out when the process started. So I ask the OS for the system time and it prints it out nicely for me. You get the idea that if we continue on this way, if I keep asking every step of the way after the uninstall, after the download, and then after the install, if I ask every time for the time, now I've got these nice printed out times, but what do I do with them? I have to mentally do some math on them. They're just displayed to the screen. Maybe I could pull them in as a variable, but you know, I did a little bit of research. I started to work with this and I started to feel that it was, it was pretty clunky. It seemed pretty clunky, it seemed a little difficult for me to do. 
with DOS command line. But I trudged through it and I figured, okay, I'm going to just manually do this process. I'll do some mental math and I'll see if the times are increasing. One of the concerns that we had was if the install takes much longer, what if the download takes much longer? What if we have network tra internal network traffic that's bogging things down? Some people might need to know. The install team might need to know. Uh, the network people might need to know. So we kept track of the times with this. So you can actually see here another time where I echo it back. And I just simply say, echo the end time. Then I have to do the mental math on it. Also, one of the things that occurred during the install was there was an install.err file that would get written out. And any errors that would happen during the installation would be appended onto the end of this file. Now, a typical user of our product, they might install once a release. Or maybe, maybe you know, a second time if they were having problems. Us developers, we developed or we would install almost daily. So we were really concerned about errors during the installation to let our installation teams know that something may have gone wrong. So they would write an entry to this file.err file. Now, during the install, that would be appended to if there was an error. It would not be written to if there was not an error. So after I was done with this script, I would then have to go and open up this file in a notepad and look at it, scroll all the way to the bottom to see if there were any errors. Seems pretty clunky and cumbersome. I could have the DOS command, the DOS batch script, open up the file for me, and I did. But it seemed like every day opening up that file became a problem. You know, looking at something that really is not worth my time at that moment because there's no errors. So you can actually see here that I just do the type of the ERR file, which basically in DOS commands dumps it out. Anybody familiar with Linux? It's, it's familiar to the cat command in Linux, Linux Unix. Okay, so you can kind of get the idea that with what I was doing here, working with DOS batch scripts to try and you know, make DOS batch scripts do some things for me automatically, it's possible, it's very possible, and there are a lot of ways to do this. And I believe there are new uh, layers on top of things now, uh, scripting. I believe there's something called PowerShell that people can use as well. But at the time when I was doing this, it just seemed very clunky and cumbersome. And it really seemed like I was doing that square peg into that round hole thing. And we all know that doesn't work. So I thought about it some more. I talked with some coworkers. And I thought about the issues that I had. So the first issue I have is the ability to subtract two times. I would like to be able to not have to do that mental math and just have the system do the math for me. It would be nice to treat those times as objects and let the system do the math. The next was to get a files modified time. Ask that, uh, have the program ask the operating system, when was that file last modified? If it was modified today, then hey, you might have an install error. If it was not modified today, there probably is not an install error. So it would be nice to have these two features, to be able to do these things programmatically. So as we all do, uh, you talk to colleagues in the hallways, uh, talk to people here in the hallways, and you always get that little bit of piece of information that sticks with you for years. And this was this one piece of information here that somebody had, I had talked with them, and they had come out with this, this, this tip, this idea. They said, well, why don't you try Python? It can probably do what you want it to do. And I thought, oh, wait, all right, great. Now, being a C++ developer um, and JavaScript, I was thinking of using those languages, but I thought, okay, let me try Python, because we all know that learning another language is great because that keeps you useful, or that, that keeps you sharp, that keeps you valuable to the company, and it also, you know, in, in troubled times, if it ever comes down to laying people off, you might be one of the last ones if you have another language behind your belt. So it's always good to pick something else up. In my particular case, it was also ex extra, an extra benefit because the new, next generation of our product, company's product was also going to be scripted in Python instead of JavaScript. So it was an extra benefit for me to get to learn this. So next thing, how many people in here are new, any, any newbies to Python within the last year or two years? Okay. 
If you've not heard of a module before, this is the concept of a module is basically a piece of code that acts as a library so that you can access the functionality out of that module or even data members out of that module. And so here's some examples of a module. You've got your main program code and this main program code can make calls to each of these modules to have these modules help the main program do something. In some examples, we've got a module called os.path. And os.path provides you to at least two functions there, excuse me, called exist and curdir, current directory. So basically, you can ask os.path, you pass it a file path, and it'll tell you, true or false, if that file exists, if that path exists. You can also have it return you the current directory as well. The next, uh, another module that we use is called shutil. That's high level file utilities. Maybe you want to copy a whole directory recursively. You can do it with a copy tree command. Maybe you want to move a file. Instead of getting out to the shell or to the calling program, maybe you just want Python to call it or move those files. So you just do an shutil.move. So these are functions that are available on these modules. Now, somebody else in your company or even yourself might have written a module that basically provides you more functionality. In this particular case, I've got some module called SumMod, and it provides me two functions called calculate average and print values as a table. Maybe that print values as a table, I take some data in and print it out as a nice, neat little formatted table. Anybody in here experienced write their own modules? Great, this is great. So using a module, quick, simple, easy to do, you just import module name, and then you call it later on in your, call, in your code by, by typing module name dot do something. Okay, it's that simple, it's that easy. So stepping back, oh yes? You don't show the other method? Instead of importing the whole module, you could say from module import just the function you need? Yes, you could do just that, exactly. You could do those types of things. Uh, so, so there are things, I'm sorry? Can you repeat that? Oh yes, the question was, yes. I can repeat So, yeah, okay. So in here he's giving the example import module name and then he's importing the module name do something. So he's calling the do something function within that module. Um, depending upon space constraints and other usage, maybe you only literally need that one function of the whole module. That module might be megabytes in size or, or whatever. And you literally are only going to call that one portion of it. You could say from module import and then just the function you need. Okay. So you're not importing that whole module at the initialization phase, you know, taking up extra memory space that you don't need or, or slowing down the program. Okay, so in that case there, you're basically just, you're using just what you need out of that module. Yeah, that, that's, 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 a, that's a great feature there. And, and that's an advancement on what we're doing here. So if you feel you're going to use, the, you know, a lot of the whole module, then yes, you can do it this way. And you, and you can do it that way to, add, to reduce down the size, specifically what you need. Um, so I started to think about then, once I started to learn a bit about Python and do some basic Hello World programs and then get the syntax down, I started to think about, okay, well now, I've read about these modules, what modules are going to help me resolve my issues? Uh, the first one was a module called Date Time. And this allowed me the ability to easily subtract two times. I just called Date Time, have it give me the time, and it gives me the time as an object, and then I can work with that object. And we'll see an example of that in a few moments. The next one was called os.path. os.path allowed me the ability to obtain a file's last modified time, which was good for that file.err issue that I had. So now I can actually look at when that file was last modified, and then let the system do some math to tell me if that was modified today, or if it was not. So here's some examples using those two to determine the elapsed time. You can see there in yellow, I have colored the first line that asks for date time dot date time dot now. And then that puts that current time right when that operation is, is performed into a variable called end time. 
earlier on in the program, I did the same thing at the very beginning, and I put it into a variable called start time. So now you can see that I can simply do the math, and it'll tell me the elapsed time. So this is much nicer and easier than me trying to sit there and go, okay, you know, it's three hours, 60 minutes, and an hour, and doing all that mental math. So this is really helpful here to be able to just let the program treat these times as objects and let it do the math for me. And then, of course, I can print out the elapsed time and maybe, you know, let team members know how long it took today to install. The next issue was to determine install errors. So OS.path helps me with that where it's, I'm, a lot, I'm using the get m time function on OS.path. I pass it the install error file path and it gives me back a date. You can see I do a little bit of tinkering around here with uh, the date and the time, uh, the date and it's and everything. I get a little further down, and here is the basic comparison I really care about. I want to know if today's date is different than the file date. So if the file date and today's date are the same from the comparison, I get back that I do not have. Or I mean, if I'm sorry, if it is this, if they are the same, then there's a good chance that it's been up, it's been updated, and that there is a good chance that there are install, install errors. If today's date is greater than file date, then yes, it must have been updated several days ago. So I can assume that there were probably no errors today. So one of the things you might be thinking about is, well, how do I work these other programs? So how do I do my actual setup.exe? How do I call my uninstall exe? How do I call the wget function or the wget command? To call other programs from within Python, one of the modules that you can use is called subprocess. And this allows you the ability to call a process and even manage that process if you wanted to. You could check return codes from that process. You could kill that process if you need to. So subprocess is useful if you don't particularly have a function in Python that you want to use, or if you're using one of your own particular custom executables or some executable from outside. You can use subprocess to call those. So let's take a few moments and take a quick peek at the listing of my program. How's the font size for everybody? Pretty good? Okay. All right, so you can kind of see that note here at the very beginning, this, is, this was one of the very early versions of my program. You kind of see that I'm doing some things here that, that, that sound, okay, usage. I'm looking at something called an argument or argv. Looks like I've got something here that looks like options. And I even have a comment in here that is, or a statement that says I'm printing optional arguments. So keep that in mind for a little bit because you'll notice I'm doing this manually. Look, I'm writing all this code manually to print out a usage statement. We'll have to see if there's a module that can do that for us. Next thing you'll see, I'm actually processing the number of arguments coming in on that command line. What first thing I do is I check to make sure I have at least two arguments or two arguments in this case. So if I don't have two arguments, I dump it out and say, sorry, you didn't give me the wrong, you gave me the wrong number of arguments. So you can kind of see that I'm doing some manual stuff in here that could be replaced by a Python module. We'll come back to that in a few moments. And of course, there's a module here called sys, and we can call exit on that, which means exit this particular process, the Python process. I have some member variable, or I have some version specific variables that I'm working through there. There's an example of the use of os.path.exists. I check to make sure that the install error file is there before I even do anything with it. Why ask for the contents of it or when it was last modified before I even know it exists? So a little bit of error checking there just to make sure the file exists. There's my get m time. There's the date time from timestamp. And of course, there's the comparison again. Okay, you can see that I'm going to open a file called this build date file. I'm just going to open it, and then I'm going to do some processing with that. I'm going to read it and then close it, put the file contents before I closed it when I read into this variable called file contents, and then I'm going to dump out the file contents. 
you can actually see another use here of shutil. I'm doing a copy on that particular file. Check to see if a file exists, if the path exists. If it does, then do a copy as well. Let's see, we have a... Here's an example of the subprocess call. I actually call out to an executable, wget.exe, and I pass it a number of arguments, which actually in this particular case scrolls off the screen, so let's take a peek at that. Okay, you can see I'm passing all of the arguments that I'm passing to wget are there as entries there on that line. I can pass the password, the username, the path, the artifactory package that I'm using, and where I'm installing from. So basically that's a subprocess call to call that executable. Okay, there's one more down below. SHUtil, there's a copy tree here as well. There is also, I believe, an SHUtil RM tree somewhere. It's probably before this. There it is, SHUtil RM tree. I checked to see in this particular case, I'm doing what I call sloppy work here where I'm checking to see if a path exists. If, if the current build is already sitting on my my, my disk, I check to see if it exists, then I remove that current build, the install package, then I recreate that directory, bring it down again, and then that way I have the current day's build. Does anybody have any questions on the script or anything like that? No? Okay. Alright, so after all that, I thought, okay, well, that was fun. I learned how to use Python. I learned the ins and outs of, of the basics of Python, and I worked with some modules. And I kept thinking to myself, well, there's got to be things I'm doing in my script that I can just do easier with Python or faster or more in a more powerful way. So I started to think about other things I could do. Like maybe my program takes on different forms. One day, maybe I don't want to back up any files. One of the things that I do whenever I develop is once I install, I back up all the binary files so that I can get back to that state just in case you know, my compilations really screw things up. So maybe there's a day where I don't want to waste that time running the backup, or maybe I don't care about backing up that day, I just want to install the build. <coughs> so I'd like my program to do that differently than it normally does. Maybe I want to get the install package, but I'm just not ready to install it just yet. So in that particular case, I can skip the uninstall, skip the install, but maybe just do the download. And of course, there's that, there's that uh, case, and it happens you know, some, somewhat often, where you know, maybe your build is just so messed up at the particular point that you just say, you know what, I need to get back to the installed state. Maybe you want to skip the download and just reinstall what you have, get back to where you were. When, before you started to make your code changes. So for that, there's a module called argparse. Argparse is in the standard library, in the Python standard library. Here's an example of some, Python, of some argparse use. In this particular case, we import argparse. So the first thing we do to set up the argparser object is we call argparse, we call the, the module itself, and we say set up an argument parser and pass it some preliminary information to initialize it. So that initializes the argument parser. Then we go and add arguments to the argument parser. Two arguments here, we can see one's called build and the next one's called backup. The build is a mandatory argument where backup with a dash is an optional argument. We have actions. What are we going to do when it encounters that argument? In the case of the build, I'm, giving, I'm specifying that it has two choices. The user can only enter two choices, either the AM build or the PM build. Maybe you have two builds during the day. Uh, a lot of our developers are uh, actually across many countries around the world. So we have different build, build, build versions 
to check their changes in to test their changes. So we basically have two check-in windows and then we have two builds throughout the day. So which one is it you want to install? Do you want to install the AM or PM? So these are choices that the user can make at the command line. So I'm already telling argparse that I, hey, I have some choices here. And you remember that using statement or that usage statement that I was doing manually before? Now I've got this little help file or this little help attribute in here that I can put a little piece of help information in there. It's kind of nice because if you don't enter enough arguments, this will be used by, by the arg parse, by Python, to give you almost a usage statement just back. So it's a nice, neat little way to do usage statement without you having to write it yourself. You can also see here that there's an action that happens whenever the, it encounters that argument. There are setups for what default value you want it to be. If for some reason in the case of an optional argument, if the user does not provide that argument, what do you have to need to tell the arg parser, hey, what do I want it to be by default? Okay. Then to actually have the arg parse object parse the arguments and process them, you want to run arg parse parse args. And then that says to that parsing object, hey, parse these arguments, process all of these, put them in something, and return it to the caller. And then I put it back in this variable called args. Later on through my program, I can go back and see. I can ask args.build. If it's AM, do something. If it's not AM, then do something else. So you can kind of see how, the, how arg parse can help you work with this rather than what I was doing before. It seemed a little clunky, right? So this is definitely an improvement over that. So throughout my travels with, with a uh, local Python users group, I had spoke with many, many people and even encountered somebody who was really, really into another module that can do the same or similar type of functionality. And there are alternatives to these things. And you'll find that there are other modules to do uh, other things as well. So I wanted to cover a couple of these uh, just because they're actually you know, different in flavor and different flexibilities. The first one is GetOpt. Excuse me, this was the original the module that was in Python. And I believe it is still there. Is anybody familiar with if Python is still, if GetOpt is still in three? I don't work much with three. No. It might still be there in three, but I understand that opt parse was the alternative that was supposed to replace get opt. So that came in around version 2.3, and it's been there for a while. So opt parse is the, uh, the the native module for parsing options. And then there's one that I just found out about a few weeks ago, and I haven't really had a chance to look into it yet. But it's called cl <laughs> click. It's called click, and there's this address here for click. And it's based on OptParse, lays over top of it. And from the uh, developer's website, uh, the phrase there is, is that it creates beautiful command line interfaces. So this might be something to look into if you want to use something. If you're creating a lot of tools where you're, you, have, you have options, let's say you know, somebody comes to you and they say, we need you to write a tool for people in this department. They need to fo copy files a lot. They need to do this. And they need to do seven other things but they want one tool to do it all. This may be something you can use, command line based, to deliver that to them. So give uh, Click a try there as well. So a little bit further, going back to my original script, the wget, the download of the new build. There's gotta be something in Python that, does, that can replicate this functionality for me. There's gotta be something there. If so, it could be faster, could even be easier to use, and there would be no need to call out to a subprocess. So in that particular case, I did some digging, looked around, and I found that there is a Python library called URL lib. There's also a companion called URL lib2, and I believe that both of them provide slightly different functionalities. You might use one versus the other in different applications. So that's URL lib and URL lib2. So the next thing I was thinking about in that whole process was to figure out sometimes I might work remotely. I might work from home. I might work from another part of the office. 
maybe while this script is running, maybe I want to know if the installation failed. Maybe somebody on the build team needs to know if that install took a long time. I mean, if a normal installation is 10 minutes and now all of a sudden it's taking a half an hour, that's really going to annoy mostly developers, but also customers as well. If, you know, the release, if this release took an hour to install more than the last release, yeah, an hour to install a program, I think pretty much most people would say, let's get rid of this thing. So if the installation takes a little bit longer, you might want to know this type of thing. So what mod Python module could I use to give me some notifications? And there's a Python module called email. What about my source control scripts? Anybody in here who works in an application, in a, um, in a company where they have source control, how many people work with source control? So you've got source control, you check in, you check out your code, you update sandboxes. In my, in my company, currently we use SVN. Um, so each day when I come in, I see that the build is good. I might say, okay, well, if the build is good, I want to sync up with the code that was used to make that build. So I'm going to go and do an update to this SVN number. So when I do that update, I manually do it right now. I use the right mouse click, and there's a program called Tortoise SVN, and it asks me for the SVN number I want to match it up against, and I do all that. That's kind of manual. So maybe there's a programmatic way I can do this that can run along with my install script, that if it does install, update the SVN code as well. So maybe I want to check out that sandbox via program. Maybe I want to be alerted to conflicts. One of the things when you work with source control programs, say somebody else changed the same line you did, you run into that risk of having a conflict. When you update your sandboxes, you really don't care if there are modifications that merge properly. You don't care about that at all. Uh, you, you, I mean, you might want to look at it, but in most cases, a successful merge is good. A bad merge, you might want to look at and figure out how to resolve that conflict. Yes? Question. By sandbox project, are you talking mostly about like a branch? Right. In in my particular case, I call a sandbox a folder full of code that happens to have. So, are, are you familiar with Git? Is Git uh, I is, use Git and SVN. I okay. use SVN for work. I use Git for personal. Okay. And I was just wondering. So, and so currently you're using like a sandboxed folder instead of like branching out for features? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's all I was asking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a plain sandbox, yeah. It's just a plain folder that I call a sandbox. But yes, whenever uh, what, what our company's uh, direction might be to switch to Git, and uh, so we might want to switch over to that. Uh, SVN does have branching, too. Okay. So. Okay. So yes, so so this in this case here, I might want to pay attention to the uh, to the logs and, and look at conflicts. The module for that is called Pi SVN. Pi SVN is not in the standard um, standard library, so you would not get this with the typical download of Python. You could download it elsewhere. So you might ask, well, where can I learn about these standard library modules? One of the websites that I had found very early on and followed for quite some time, uh, there was a gentleman who put a website together called Python Module of the Week. And he blogged about a different module that's in the standard library every week. This got so popular that he turned it into a book. So I highly recommend if you're looking for a library, standard library reference book that you consider this book here, Python standard library by example. And you might ask, okay, well, where can I find a module to do this? Or where can I find a module to do that? Anything you can think of, you probably have an idea that there's a Python module out there to do it. One of the ways to find it is something called the Python package index, or pypy.python.org. And you basically can type anything in there, and you'll get back a listing of modules that meet that search criteria. Now, of course, like anything else, these are things that people submit libraries to or modules to. They could be good, they could be bad. You always got to make sure you check things out before you use them in any production environment. But you can see here I did a quick search on, uh, on the side. I like to do some astronomy. So I was looking for some things to find planetary orbits, orbital calculations. So I did a search on astronomy, and you can see here, at least just all the way down to this particular point here, 
I've got you know X number of responses matching astronomy. Okay, so this is a nice neat little feature here to use this Python package index. Your favorite module. Does anybody in here have any really favorite modules, modules they've developed that they actually put out for people to share or anything like that? Anybody have one they want to yell out? Any module developers here? No? Okay. And of course, like we all know, you can talk to folks in your local users group. If you don't happen to know, if you're new to Python and you don't happen to know of a users group in your area, of course you can go to this website and find a users group. And apologies to anybody, any users groups I may not have referenced here. Sorry. <laughs> On Meetup, yes, yes, I've heard that mentioned earlier in the session, and actually in the, uh, almost in what was the keynote, was, you know, talking about Meetups. Meetups are, you know, people say Meetup.com, and you might think something sounds a little sleazy, but no, Meetup.com is a very good place to find other techies, I'm telling you that right now. Definitely worth trying out. So, in all, I want to think about this for a moment and ask, well, would I do this again? Would I go back and try all this again? And the answer to this question depends on a few things. The first thing I thought about was Python seems flexible. There's many ways to do things. I've got different modules to do things. Everybody's got some ideas on how I can program differently, more efficiently. Definitely a lot more flexible than DOS command line. It's also more powerful. I've got more modules to do things. I've got modules to do things that DOS command line may not have had for me. I may have had to call third-party programs or make my own program maybe in C++ and expose the functionality out. Also, I learned a new language in the process, and we all know that that's always good to do, especially you know, around your company as far as moving forward and such. And of course, this supports the right tool for the, for the job kind of concept. So no more square peg into a round hole for this particular case. I've got that round peg and I was working with it properly using Python to write my batch script. So the answer to that question really is, yes, I would do this again. Okay, so at this point, I'd like to take some questions. Feedback? Did you get any pushback from your company about using Python? Was it part of their environment? Or if it wasn't, did they worry about, say, the bus number? If uh, you're the only person who knows how to uh, do this updating process. I did not from the company. And one thing he mentioned was the, the bus number or the bus factor. If anybody has never heard of the bus factor concept before, the bus factor is the number of people it would take to get hit by a bus to kill a project. It's kind of morbid, but think about that for a moment. It's the number of people it would take to kill a project if they got hit by a bus. So in this particular case, at my company, fortunately, no, because the newer version of our product was going to Python. We had some visionaries, some architecture folks that stepped in and said, we're taking this to Python, so on and so forth. They argued all the things. They were happy going with Python for the new, new, pro new product. Where I did get some pushback was from my coworkers in my particular department. Some of them just not, familiar, not really happy with the idea of a different language, um, you know, using new scripting tools is always a learning curve. So a little bit of that, but not much. But yes, in general, the company was pretty receptive. So, any other questions? I know you mentioned a lot about um, pulling down your build, mm -hmm. but you mentioned that separate from your SVN repository. I was just kind of curious exactly what's what's building your executable. I know a lot of us here are probably familiar with like Travis or Jenkins. But that's more of like a web sort of thing seems like you actually have an, an application specific like build process going on. Yes, uh, our compiled code is in C++, so it's using uh, Visual Studio compilers. And they run, before they used to run batch scripts to do the uh, builds, but now I believe they use something called Team City. It's like a web application that basically runs the builds for them. They still use the Windows compilers but Team City coordinates all of this building together. So it's a C++ application that is accessed by JavaScript through automation interfaces, if anybody's familiar with MIDL interface language with Microsoft. Any other questions? No? Okay, well there are handouts that, um, that were passed out and those have a lot of the module names on there and everything and the links and everything. So. Um, I thank you all and enjoy lunch and the rest of the day. Thank you.